you have your Bible with you this morning, be turning to the book of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. If you recall last week, we talked about the message of John the Baptist and the message of Jesus being repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The word repent meaning a changing of our minds, to reconsider after the fact. And so that was the message, um, to, to change our minds, to change our minds about how that we approach God, to change our minds about how we uh, as, as John the Baptist was preaching, how that we um, think and how we are to approach God and how we think about getting to be where he is. The message was then repeated by Jesus, to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And uh, his message was no different than John's because uh, he spoke to the religious leaders of the day, the scribes, the Pharisees, uh, the lawyers of the day, uh, as well as everyday folks. And the message was still the same. It was for everyone to change their mind about how they approach God, about how that they could come in to be a part of his holiness. And today we're going to see where uh, Paul clearly has a message about our minds. And <clears throat> so don't lose your mind, renew your mind. And, you know, we, we often think about, you know, losing our minds being that we have just uh, gone off the deep end or uh, we, we don't know what to do with ourselves. We, we find ourselves, you know, emotionally or, uh, you know, whatever in a state where uh, we, we can't think clearly, we can't think straight. Uh, and, and we don't make good decisions when we're in that condition. But Paul tells the church in Rome in this letter to renew your mind. <clears throat> Look at verses 1 and 2 of Romans chapter 12. Paul wrote, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect or complete. <coughs> Excuse me. The book of Romans, as we have it, is probably the closest thing in the Bible to a systematic theology of, of the gospel, meaning that it describes the gospel, its action, the work of it, uh, and, and the effects of it in detail, as well as the result of it. Paul didn't found the church in Rome as most of the letters that he wrote to other churches in the New Testament uh, on his missionary journeys. However, uh, as we have read in the New Testament, Paul indicates that he wants to go to Rome and visit there uh, as he had intentions and plans on going on to the region of Spain to carry the gospel there. And as a result of his desire to go that way, uh, he writes this letter to the, the Roman church as a way to introduce himself to that <laughs> congregation and as a way to give them an overview of the gospel and what it means in the lives of believers. And he writes this letter to this church because major, a majority of that church were Gentile believers. Just a few uh, Jewish believers because think about where they were. They were in Rome, which was um, the, the, the main city of the, the, the Roman Empire. Uh, that's where all of the, the senators and uh, uh, the, the, the leaders, the emperor of the day, would have been. And, and so he writes this letter to them uh, to, to tell them about the gospel, to tell them how the gospel operates. Uh, they've already put their faith and believed in Jesus Christ, and they've come together as a group of believers. 
But he's writing this to kind of clarify any questions that they might have. And, and so Romans chapter 12 in this letter marks the transition in, in there where Paul's theological teaching turns to practical teaching or application of the theological teaching. And so he's taught the, the great doctrine of the gospel in the first 11 chapters, talking about God's righteousness, how that how that's, that's the main need that we have and that, and that God's the only place we can get it and how God has, out of his love for us, supplied that which we need. And, and he talks about how that it's ours through faith in Christ. And then in, in, in this practical section, uh, the last few chapters of Romans 12 through 16, he, he teaches about how that we live in the light of the, the salvation and the saving power of the gospel. And, and, and Paul says, as we begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 12, therefore, and so everything he's just had you consider in verses, uh, or in chapters 1 through 11, therefore, and then he says, apply it in this way. And so we're not going to take all the time this morning to read those first 11 chapters. Uh, hopefully we're doing that on our own anyway. Uh, but... He says, therefore, live like this because we needed righteousness, because God supplied that righteousness, and because righteousness is only found by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, therefore, live a righteous life in this way. And so the first thing that Paul encourages uh, those people to do and, and us as we read this today is to be renewed in our mind. Look at those first two verses again. Paul said, therefore, because of everything I've just told you in this earliest parts of this letter, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. That's what it means to truly worship God. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So there again, the, the mercies of God that he's referring to there in verse 1 is, is everything that has proceeded in chapters 1 through 11. And what Paul presents here is since we have been so uh, uh, graciously and mercifully loved on, that, that we have been these recipients of God's great mercies, we are to be living sacrifices to God. And he's gone through and he's talked about what the sacrifice meant, what, what it meant for Jesus to be our sacrifice for sin. And so how do we do this? How do we become a living sacrifice? Well, we are living sacrifices to God by not conforming to this world. He, he says that in a, in a way that, that the readers would have understood that, that this age or the spirit of this age is referring to the things of the world. And he says that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And this encouragement, this, this exhortation, serves as a summary statement for all that follows in the rest of this letter. And, and so he's saying this is how you live the Christian life. This is how you do life as a believer. And he says that you present your body as a living sacrifice so that you can be set apart or holy, so that you can be pleasing and have a pleasurable life so that you can discern or know or understand the perfect will of God. Exactly what the Lord wants you to do. And he says, don't be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's, that's how we do that. That, that. That's something that we have to do each and every single day as a believer. So, what he refers to as the world or the spirit of this age 
He's talking about the worldview that rejects God. The worldview that says that this is fairy tale. The worldview that says you are your own leader. You don't have to submit to anyone. Do your own thing. Make your own way. However you want to describe it. That's what the world says. It rejects the things of God. It rejects the authority of God. It rejects the salvation offered by God. And so when we are unbelievers, we are unable to understand certain things because we are naturally conformed to this world. We were born into a fallen creation, and, and that makes us part of the fallen creation. That, that means that we are sinners by birth. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul said to that church, You were dead in your trespasses and in your sins, in which you previously lived according to the ways of the world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, referring to Satan the spirit that now works in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly or worldly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh or self and our thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. So he says just because we are born into this world, we are born into... A position that, that when God looks at us, he says that we are sinful by our nature. Because we descended from Adam and Eve, the ones who initially sinned that caused the fall of this world. But as believers, we are called to no longer conform to this world. Because we no longer belong to this world. We don't belong to the spirit of this age. We don't, we don't serve the world. We don't serve our flesh. We don't, we don't look out for ourselves. We begin to serve others. We begin to serve the Lord in dutiful obedience. And so as believers, we have been changed. We have been, as the Bible says, translated from the kingdom of darkness or the, 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 the present age into the kingdom of God's Son. A verse that we looked at last week and a verse that applies to uh, the, the, the text that we're looking at this week, Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. In Him, referring to Jesus, the Son He loves, we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. And so a change of mind, repentance, leads to us being translated or transferred into that kingdom. And that means that, that we have an opportunity to renew our mind because we have been changed. Now, th these are words that we all understand. If, if we have been translated, if you think about that word, that means that we have changed how it's perceived, how it's reflected or how it's uh, understood. If you translate something from, from English to Spanish or Spanish to English, we, we, we're trying to understand and communicate, right? Most of the time in English, we would say, look at that blue car. In Spanish, they would say, look at the car that is blue. We, both, we, we understand both of those descriptions, but they're just said in different ways. And so when we are translated or transferred, we, we've gone from one form to another. And when we're translated from, from the world's kingdom into the kingdom of God, into Christ's kingdom, we are different. We have the opportunity, because we've changed our mind, to begin to renew our mind. If you transfer something, you're taking it from one place and putting it in another. We all transfer money from time to time, don't we? We either take it out of the bank and give it to someone else, or we move it from checking to savings or savings to checking. We write a check, and we, we've transferred it from our account to that person's account who cashes it or that business's account. And so we understand what those words mean, that there's still value, there's still worth, but we're applying it in a different way. And so our value, our worth, actually increases when we're translated or transferred into the kingdom of God. Because we can begin to renew our mind and to 
think godly ways, to think godly thoughts, to live in a godly way. And so to paraphrase Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 1 and, and 2, therefore, rather than continuing to conform to this world, rather than continuing to be like this world, we are transformed by having our minds renewed. We're changed because we're allowing our mind to be renewed. It's interesting to note here that Paul says we must be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Well, our hearts are already new, right? We've already been given a new heart. God has forgiven our sinful nature, our sinful heart. We've been given a, a new life by the guarantee of the resurrection. The Bible tells us that we have been raised into a newness of life in Christ. And so it only makes sense that we get a new mind as well. The mind is the key to the Christian life. A lot of times we put emphasis on the heart. A lot of times we put emphasis on the soul. But the mind is the key to the Christian life. That's, that's the reason why a non-Christian doesn't understand or respond to the truths that we find in the Scriptures. They can't understand the spiritual truths. There are certain things that are revealed to them that that bring them to a place of conviction so that they can change their mind and then renew their mind after that. But until a person becomes a believer, there's a lot about the Scripture that, that is misunderstood or uh, veiled, if you want to say that word. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, The person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit because it is foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. So when we are saved, when we have the Spirit as our guide and as our interpreter for scriptural things, we have that to evaluate spiritual things. But if we don't have the Spirit, we can't evaluate it properly and correctly. And so it doesn't mean the same to us. It's not, it's not the same context to us. So the gospel calls for the unbeliever to repent of their sin and to embrace or call on Christ by faith. We talked about that last week, and I'll remind you again, the Greek word repentance carries the notion of a change of mind. And so our thinking also must be transformed or changed from the old ungodly ways to new godly ways of thinking. So once we change our mind, we've got a whole new way of going at life. We think about things differently. And that causes us to act about things differently. And it causes us to pursue different things, to live in different ways, to talk in different ways. And so that's why the world notices the change in us is because of the Spirit and the renewing of our mind. So in order for our mind to go through this renewal, we have to understand why we have to have our mind renewed. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're only going to be there for just a few verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Now, I already read you verse 14 that deals with the unbeliever being unable to understand the things that the Spirit teaches. But back up to verse 12, and we're going to read verse 12 through 16, and, and we'll have a better concept of that renewed mind and that, that spiritual eyes. Verse 12, he says, Now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand what has freely uh, been given us by God. We also speak these things, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. And that's verse 14 where he says, But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit, because it is foolishness to him. He doesn't understand. He's not able to understand since it is evaluated spiritually. But here's where he talks about the renewed mind. Verse 15, 
The spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything, talking about spiritual things, and yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. For who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him? And that's a quote from Isaiah chapter 4. But look at that last line that Paul says there in verse 16. But we have the mind of Christ. Now he's saying that about himself as he's writing these instructions to the church at Corinth. But he's also saying, and it's, it's implied that we as believers, we have, we can have the mind of Christ. Paul, as a believer, as an instructor of spiritual things, has the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? It doesn't mean that we know everything about everything because of everything. That means... The mind which does not exalt itself or its own wisdom, but a mind that submits to God and to the will and to the authority of God. That is the mind of Christ. Submission. Servitude. That's why, if you think about it, why we tell our kids, you better mind you. I'm telling you what is right. I'm telling you what's beneficial. I'm the authority figure in this relationship, so I need you to mind me. That's what Paul is telling the, the, the church at Corinth. And that's what the Spirit tells us when we read his word. Mind me. Submit to me. Be under my authority. And serve me. And so the mind of Christ is the one that submits to God and submits to the will and the authority of God. And until, as Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind until we change our mind and we accept Christ. And then we allow the word to renew our mind. We're not going to submit. We're not going to be under his authority. And we're not going to be obedient. We're still going to be conformed to that old way. We're going to resist. And that's why we have such a hard time with once and for all putting away every single thing that is sinful in our lives. Because we have allowed ourselves to continue to be conformed to the old ways. And we haven't begun to allow the Spirit to renew our mind. Yes, we're saved. Yes, we're, we're blood-bought and, and we're sanctified and we're justified and we, one day we will be glorified but in that process we have to be renewed in our mind and so the only way to replace the, the error of the world's way of thinking the old way of thinking is to replace it with God's way of thinking with God's truth with God's word and and that is what we find in scripture the Bible transformation through renewed minds comes when we, as believers, expose ourselves to God's Word in three different ways. Very simply, faithful exposition on a regular basis, meaning that we sit under the teaching of the Word of God, the preaching of the Word of God. Secondly, it means that we expose ourselves to personal Bible study. How are we going to know if we don't read it? We can be told, but unless we read it for ourselves, it doesn't mean as much to us. And thirdly, a group Bible study. Sunday school. Someone that, that, that you know, love, and trust to talk about the Word with you. Even if it's just two of you, or four of you, or, or 20 of you. We have to, to come together and study the Word individually as well as corporately. And, and that just helps us to, to renew our mind because the Word is changing us individually as well as corporately. Preaching the Word, reading the Word, 
even singing the word. Have you noticed a lot of the hymns that we sing actually have scripture in them? Would you be more inclined to remember the words to a song or to memorize scripture? As long as we're remembering scripture, whether it's in song or whether it's black and white, it begins to renew our mind. It begins to change us. It begins to help us draw closer to God and farther away from what we used to be conformed to. But make no mistake about it, there are no shortcuts. There is no magic formula. There's no easy 12-step process like some of these fad things that we get into. Do this, this, and this, and you'll experience this, this, and this. One way. The Word. The Word. Jesus said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them in your truth. The Word is true. The word sanctify means to be set apart as or declared holy. So Paul said in verse 1 of Romans 12, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. So the word sanctifies us. And makes us holy. And as we renew our mind, we present ourselves as holy to God. And so they're all independent of each other, but yet they all work together for our benefit. Salvation. The changing of our mind. The renewing of our mind. Being redeemed. Being justified. Being sanctified. It all goes together. John the baptizer, Jesus, they preached a message about a change of the mind. Repent. Change your mind about how you approach God, about how you think you are <laughs> capable and able to approach God and what it means to approach God. Paul here in this letter challenges us to change our mind, to renew that mind. The gospel calls us to change our mind. But Paul in this letter challenges us to renew our mind. Only a changed mind can lead to a mind that is renewed. That means that we line up with Scripture. Paul challenges us to replace our previous ways of thinking and our previous ways of living in order to line up with God's ways. To change, to make things line up correctly. To make the Bible to be what our lives want to look like. We make our lives fit the Bible. We don't just make time and make the Bible fit our lives. We don't use it to justify the things that we do, but rather it changes us. It renews us by the renewing of our mind. And when we, when we read Scripture and we, we apply it to our life and we see that there are some things where we don't add up, we don't line up, and it convicts us. And it causes us to want to address those areas. And therefore, we're constantly renewing our mind. To be like Christ. To submit to the authority of God. To be obedient to God. So Paul said, therefore, I urge you. Strong encouragement. I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can discern what is the good, pleasing, and 
perfect will of God. And this morning, if you really and truly desire and want to worship God, change your mind, and then renew your mind through the Word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this glimpse into this wonderful letter that Paul has written to the church at Rome. Father, how that we know that we need you, how that we know that you can supply the things that we stand in need of. And it's only in you that we can meet those needs. Father, I thank you that we have the opportunity and the ability to not only change our mind, but to have our minds renewed. And Lord, help us to all have a renewed mind, and have the mind of Christ, a mind that is submitted to you, that is under your authority, that is obedient to you.